We are joined once again by Sean Payne, a uh, investigator with the NTSB. If you haven't listened to part one of our conversation yet, we highly encourage you to do so. What we talked about in, in part one of our conversation was how the NTSB and, and other investigative agencies use flight data recorders. And it, we focused most of our conversation on the, uh, on the cockpit voice recorder, but it, it applies more generally and how those devices and and the information from those devices can be used to inform an investigation. Sean has graciously agreed to to stick around and, and discuss looking forward now. So the NTSB recently put out its 2021-2022 most wanted list and we are going to focus in on one of the particular items and that is, I'll just read it straight from the list. The FAA should mandate crash resistant recorders in all passenger carrying operations and require data monitoring and analysis programs. Operators should not wait for mandates to do so. They can realize the safety benefits of these technologies now. So Sean, thanks for coming back. We appreciate you joining us once again. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to cover part two. (laughs) Hey, Jason. So I'm just going to pick apart that sentence and let's start from the very beginning. The FAA should mandate crash resistant recorders. So I think one of the things that we need to clarify for, for some people listening probably already know this because we've talked about, I think we've talked about this in the past uh, and Jason can correct me if I'm wrong, but the NDSB is an investigative agency focused solely on the safety of transportation and has no regulatory authority. So, so even if you wanted to say everyone who is driving a bus and piloting an aircraft has to wear a, a pink hat, <laughs> you couldn't do that. That's correct. So the NTSB, we're an independent federal agency, and we're uh, tasked with investigating tra- transportation accidents. And in the aviation sense, you know, every aircraft accident in the United States. So we do not have the ability to create regulation. We only have our accident reports in which we can suggest um, new ideas, essentially, to create a wish list, so to speak, of what we can do to increase transportation safety, as you said. So the FAA should mandate crash resistant recorders in all passenger carrying operations. We talked about this a little bit in in part one, but there aren't crash resistant recorders in all airplanes that carry paying passengers? That's correct. So as we touched on in part one, you know, part 91, part 135, and part 121. Part 91, most people associate with general aviation. However, there are exemptions that allow paying passengers to take uh, part one, part 91 flights. So even in part 91, we're looking in areas where complex, high performance turbine powered aircraft are carrying passengers and they're simply not required by the FAA to even carry a recorder in the first place. If you go um, look at 135, for example, um, the same goes there. You're, you're booking a charter flight to go somewhere on a private jet, say. That private jet might only have a CDR. It might not have an FDR. Furthermore, it might not have avionics that are even capable of recording instrumentation data. So uh, not that that's meant to survive an accident, but there are some cases, I would say some, I'd say more often than not in, in, in these spaces with these 91 and 135 high performance turbine powered aircraft, where we're simply not getting flight data in the first place from a federally sanctioned crash protected recorder. In fact, in the most wanted list, it's spelled out explicitly that between 2005 and 2017, uh, of the uh, fatal crashes investigated by the NTS- NTSB, 86% of those aircraft had no recording equipment whatsoever. That is a huge percentage that must make the investigation process so much more difficult than it needs to be. Yeah, I think the misconception is that when a plane crashes, the general public kind of expects that, oh, there's a flight recorder and someone can just plug it in and download it. In a lot of these cases, as Jason said, 86%. Uh, there's simply no no data like that to go on. There might be some kind of sparse instrumentation data, but there's not a federally sanctioned recorder in these aircraft or helicopters that, that will help us lead to, to an answer to make safety improvements. So it might actually be the case that the best and possibly only data that you're going to get for some of these crashes is actually ADSB playback on, on sites <laughs> like Flight Radar 24. And that's kind of 
mind boggling, actually. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, ADSB data does often come into play. And in these investigations where we don't have a lot to go on, maybe ADSB data is, is the only you know, element of, of data that we do have. Uh, we often rely on what we call a performance study. So we're finding ways to take this sparse data and try to reach a probable cause. Uh, in a performance study, for example, we look at what is the aircraft capable of doing physically through the air based on the points in the route it flew through the air. And what does that mean in the overall context of the accident? So we're having to perform, you know, quite a bit of detailed analysis and studies just to get at some simple questions that could easily be answered by a, a crash protective recorder. So besides a, a recorder that's included a, a federally sanctioned recorder to, to kind of use the, that, that particular phrase yes. and publicly available ADSB data, what other types of I guess recorders are you seeing in aircraft that that are proving helpful or or maybe not helpful in investigations? Yeah, I think we should definitely touch on the fact that we've received about 650 image recording devices in about the past five years in the NTSB just for aviation. Uh, a lot of times, these cameras, for lack of you know better word, it, we're, we're getting GoPros, we're getting cell phone videos from passengers, stuff like that. Um, a lot of times these devices are associated with accidents that don't or an aircraft that don't have crash protective recorders. And you can imagine that the use of these images is and, and video is highly val valuable in the investigation and can answer quite easily, you know, what happened. So those videos are often taken from a passenger's perspective or or they're mounted you know if it, we're talking about a gopro they're they're mounted by either the pilots or or passenger themselves and they've kind of got a, a single field of view but that's not really what the ntsb is talking about as far as you know cockpit image recorders is it Right. Yeah. So first, I want to stress that when we receive a device like this, when we receive data like this, it's handled in a way that is exactly similar to how a CVR would be handled. So the protections that are applied to a CVR for handling the data uh, are applied the same way to uh, an image recording device. That said, when the NTSB has asked for image recording devices, they're quite a bit different than, than a GoPro, for example. The types of devices we're talking about uh, do exist in the crash investigation community, and uh, they're almost surgical in nature. In other words, they are providing a, a very limited view of the flight crew. For example, ICAO and Annex 6 set forth some guidelines for investigative tools such as image recorders. And in the ICAO guidelines, they say that a future standard should eliminate the flight crew's head and torso to the greatest extent possible. So I think to clarify some misconceptions, these recordings are actually not showing most of the pilot. What they're focused on is the instrument panel, the flight crew's interface with the instrument panel and flight controls, as well as a view outside the cockpit. Uh, they're also, in some cases, and, and the standards are emerging, not even a video in itself, but rather still images. So this highly special, specialized way of using imagery or video data is something the NTSB is asking for. And I want to clarify that's very different from asking for a GoPro installed in uh, every airline cockpit. That's simply not what we're talking about. So this may be a question that you can answer, or we might need to to call someone up at, at, at Boeing, Airbus, <laughs> Embraer, et cetera, et cetera. But it, has there been any look at now that most new aircraft are, are going to a, a glass cockpit and, and LCD screens and things like that. Is there a way of just broadcasting what those screens are showing to a recorder? So, I mean, kind of negating the, the – because you're, you're interested in the instrumentation, right? Right, right, exactly. So, what the image recorders are – what we have been using them for in, in many instances is to supplement instrumentation or instrumenting the aircraft. So, as you said, just sticking a camera that looks at the instrument panel gives you – all the, I'll say, lack of a better word, health data of the aircraft, right? So that said, when um, ICAO is discussing image recorders, there's different classes of image recorders. And I believe the class that most people think of in terms of being a camera that looks in the cockpit is class A. However, there are other subsequent classes that might just capture uh, screenshots of the of the flight instrumentation displays, as you said. That's why I like talking to you guys. You guys are always ahead of the ball and know, know what kind of questions to ask you. So that was great, you know, great view into what the future of these devices might also include.
Interestingly, many aircraft today, especially wide bodies, they already have video cameras throughout the aircraft. So many, many have cameras in the passenger cabins. Some even have multiple cameras outside, either on the tail, providing a view of the fuselage, right. or in the case of the 777-300ER, they actually have flight deck accessible cameras that look back at the uh, wingtips to help them navigate around the airport. But to my knowledge, none of that is actually recorded and is able to be used in an investigation. Would yeah. external camera recording also be helpful? Yeah, great question. Uh, none of that right now is going to the FDR. And I'd be careful to include any view of inside the passenger cabin, but certainly the context of those cameras that are used to help taxi the aircraft or provide a view of the in-flight entertainment system to outside the aircraft are discussed in the new ICAO guidelines around image recorders, and there is a plan to potentially capture those if, if regulated. So it, the call for the image recorders is kind of separate from, it's not kind of separate, it is separate from the adding flight data recorders to aircraft that right. don't currently have them. I mean, is there, there's obviously a cost to this, which is why airlines and, and especially, you know, part, part 91, part 135 operators don't do it on their own. The second part of this is require data monitoring and analysis programs. And it seems to me that not only is, is that a, a safety issue first and foremost, but it seems to me that there would be some some operational benefits to those programs as well with these right. recorders. Right. So I'll start with the, the first part of your question and or the expense and maybe older aircraft that are being upgraded that don't have an FDR. So I used to be an instrumentation engineer for the Navy when I said I worked in flight test in part one and my job in, involved me, you know, wiring aircraft and aircraft systems to collect data. And that process can be, you know, very in-depth, very expensive and very, you know, time consuming. And I, I don't want to keep going back to image recorders, but an interesting way as to how to use an image recorder in this scenario is if we're asking these older Part 91, Part 135 aircraft to be, for lack of a better term, instrumented, the easiest way to do that instead of putting a CVR and FDR in it is to put some kind of image recording device. If you have a simple way to collect digital data, then, as you said, as part of the FDM program, which is this, the second part of the most wanted list item we're asking for, you can then exploit that data like the airlines are currently doing to try to find some safety benefits or areas in which flight crews can improve their performance or uh, things other pilots can, can learn from so they can avoid the same problems uh, maybe made on a flight previously. So I want to kind of flag that part right there. That Airlines okay. are already doing this. Right. So the flight data monitoring and the, they already have programs that take data that the aircraft is giving them and making, you know, kind of making their operations safer. So this isn't necessarily a, we think this would be a good idea. It already is a good idea. So is the barrier to entry really just retrofitting aircraft that don't already come equipped with this? Well, of course, everything in aviation is a bit more complicated than that. And I think one barrier for implementing this is the airlines, uh, the Part 121 airlines have a lot of resources. They have a lot of employees. As we look at 135 and 91, the challenges become, okay, maybe you're a Part 91 operator where you're taking paying passengers on a photo flight. Do you have as many employees to staff a FOQA program or sorry, flight operations quality assurance program? Uh, or use an FDM device to exploit its data? And, and the answer there is, is usually no, or they have a very limited amount of employees to do that or resources. I think where we're looking to apply this in 91 and 135 is the tech that's out there now can certainly assist these operators in becoming enabled, maybe not to the extent that an airline does it, but certainly to an extent that would capture some safety improvements that could very well avoid an accident in the future. One of the big criticisms of the request to install cockpit video recording or, or additional monitoring is a, is a privacy aspect. And while I don't want to get into necessarily for and against, mm -hmm. I think it might be a good idea to discuss the difference between what an NTSB investigation right. is and what the goal of that investigation is versus, you know, someone who might be trying to to work on behalf of an insurance company or criminal or, or civil litigation. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think this is a great place to interject that. I think one of the reasons I work at NTSB and enjoy what I'm doing is – 
you'll never hear anyone in NTSB use the word blame. What we're looking for in a safety investigation is what went wrong with a system usually and where in the system do changes need to be made in order to prevent it happening again. Um, we, we never say whose fault was it, you know, or who was to blame. And I think, you know, throughout the aviation industry, even in 121 airline operators that are using FOCO and FDM devices, it's important to stress that these investigations are non-punitive and they're only for increasing uh, safety awareness. So unless there's a strict rule that the operator uh, cannot use this data in a punitive way, that, that would be that would go a long way in, in helping to adopt these recommendations. So we have said that in the past in, in, in other recommendations related to FDM devices and FDM programs. But I think it's something that as you know, one of the reasons I'm going on the podcast is we, we need to clarify this publicly and remind people that a safety investigation is a safety investigation. It's to, it's to save lives. It's to make transportation safer. It's not to blame the pilot. It's not to blame a particular person in the organization. It's to look for those Swiss cheese holes, the different slices in the reason model of I started getting more philosophical about the idea of an accident investigation, but it's to look where we can prevent these accidents from happening and fix those problems without punishing someone. So at the end of an investigation, the NTSB final report comes out and and Jason and I sit down with our cups of coffee and go through them. And there's always, at the end of every report, there's always kind of, you know, safety recommendations for that particular incident and, or or accident or, or whatever has happened. And so I'm wondering... How could the mandate of a crash resistant recorder or even some sort of video recorder and and then you know a monitoring program how could that are there any specific examples that you can point to where, where you're like, okay, it's very very likely that if they had been doing these things and, and had a right. safety program beforehand, we likely would have avoided this. Sure. Let's talk in context of FDM first. So in terms of avoiding an accident that was preventable altogether, one of the accidents you can look at, some of the listeners might be familiar with it, is a overrun of a Gulf Stream in Bedford, Massachusetts. uh, Massachusetts, I think it was, uh, sorry, I don't have the report in front of me, but it was a few years ago. Um, What we found there ultimately was the flight crew uh, did not unlock the gust lock before they took the runway and applied throttle. Uh, when they went to rotate, they were unable to rotate and uh, subsequently ran off the end of the runway at a high rate of speed and hit a drainage ditch. Unfortunately, it was uh, fatal to, to everyone in that aircraft, including the flight crew. What we found, uh, that particular aircraft it was not mandated to have, did have a quick access recorder. That's a device that you would use for flight data monitoring. So beyond the two hours that a CBR or FDR would record, This device, I think it recorded over 200 hours of data. Luckily, it survived the accident, which might not have been guaranteed because it's not crash protected. But we were able to look through that data. And we found that in a majority of the previous flights in that 200 hours of data, the flight crew had not done something as simple as performing a a, uh, flight flight control check. So um, had they identified that the flight crew was not performing a flight crew uh, flight control check, you can see very easily how something that simple, which was ensuring that, ensuring that they follow the checklist and perform the flight control check, could have very well avoided that accident. That's a pretty clear example and one of, one of the easiest ones. So this isn't something that, I mean, it, it's something that is very regimented and, and needs to be mandated in a very specific way to make it non-punitive. But that's something that an operator could say, okay, we've noticed this, and then we can go back to our training on this. Or we can, you know, begin kind of, you know, everybody here. It seems as simple as just, you know, sending out an email uh, for, for some of these things. Right. And, and it can be in certain cases. I think guaranteeing that non-punitive uh, use of the data is certainly a challenge especially for the 91 and 135 operators. And the NTSB needs to get out there, you know, just as proactively with the pilots in that stance. And as we discussed earlier, you know, remind people what a safety investigation is and why the use of this data is valuable, especially in a non-punitive way. 
Is there anything else that, that you think our listeners should know about this particular most wanted list item? I, as I said before, I think we are really working with a lot less data that you can that, that the general public thinks we are. Even for larger aircraft, if we look at the Atlas accident in, in uh, Baytown, Texas, the Atlas Amazon Prime branded uh, cargo plane, that recorder was only required to have 34 parameters. It had a bit more than that, but the conclusions we came to would have been greatly benefited, benefited by having a, a more robust view of what was going on in that aircraft. And I think when we're asking to sit quite simply install crash resistant recorders, I think that's my main talking point here is saying that just because there's a jet flying overhead doesn't mean that the FAA has mandated a flight recorder in the first place. And if it has, is it really recording all the data that we need to, to get to an accurate probable cause to prevent it from happening again? I think really that's the main uh, takeaway that, that I would project from, from this particular most wanted list item. Sean Payne, mechanical engineer, NTSB investigator, and a uh, really good sport to come on uh, <laughs> two episodes in the row. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really hoping that, that we can have you back on after the, the most wanted list is, is no longer wanted. And we can <laughs> talk about how that has benefited the NTSB safety investigations. So thanks again for joining us. We really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thanks. thanks for having me and uh, letting me talk about uh, some of the great improvements we can hopefully make and prevent these accidents altogether. Thanks, guys. Thanks.